Hello, welcome to the Pursuit of Excellence with me, Anthony Bayruti. Need your help real quick. If you like the videos, hit the thumbs up button right below and please subscribe to get access to our latest interviews. Hit the subscribe button right there. Also, we'd love to hear from you about our interviews. In the comment section, tell us who you want us to interview or what you thought about the whole thing. Without further ado, enjoy the interview. We're very excited today to be joined by Coach Kurt Thornton. Thank you very much, Coach. You're welcome. So let's go back to the beginning. When did you get started with sport? When you were young, what sports were you playing? And, and let's go from there. Sure. So I, I grew up in a, a small town in northwestern Ontario, Fort Francis, uh, only about 9,000 people, uh, right on the Minnesota border. Uh, but, uh, you know, for, for a town that size, uh, the closest towns that had any kind of sports were about two hours away. So when you're involved in sport, you, you're always traveling, right? So it was a little different than here where you've got schools just a couple blocks away. Uh, but growing up, it's a hockey town, right? Northern Ontario, that's pretty much was the only organized sport until you got into high school. And I never, I tried hockey, but it just, it just wasn't for me. And, uh, you know, my dad was a guy who enjoyed sport, but he wasn't, uh, other than curling, he wasn't a coach or, or whatever, but he taught in the high school. And I remember going to a lot of high school games, sometimes the football games or, or the hockey games, and, and just couldn't wait to be a part of being on a team, right? A real team. And uh, one of my earliest memories of football and kind of what hooked me with football was my mom's American and she's from Duluth, Minnesota. And my, my great grandma lived there and we're driving back and it's, I think it was December and my dad had the Vikings game on and I was maybe eight years old. And it was one of these playoff games where they had this huge comeback and like there was a hook and ladder that they ran and a toss pass. And I'm, my dad's trying to explain this to me in the car and I'm eight years old and I just loved it. Like trying to visualize how these plays were happening and, and then I started watching football with him. And then I started watching football without him because I was so hooked. And I remember being like nine years old and watching. You know, I was a big Chargers fan, Vikings fan, because they, they threw the ball around. And it was, it was cool for me, right? And then, I start, then we just started playing, you know, as friends, like most kids did back then. We're outside all the time. We started throwing the ball a lot. And my older brother played, played for the high school. And like I said, I couldn't wait to be the, the team was called the muskies of all time. so uh, I wanted to be a muskie and so when I got into high school uh, you know played junior varsity football and then senior varsity football and uh, we were fortunate we had some really committed coaches uh, one of our coaches Scott Fawcett had been uh, a coach in the CFL and uh, throughout youth sport and had done some time in the NCAA as well and he really he came in when I was in grade 11 and uh, he he really taught us the game and and it was a turning point for me because I realized that there was just what I thought I knew was really nothing and there's you you can always learn more in football and so when he came we all thought holy cow this is now this is this just got really hard right everything seemed more complicated and it took a while but once things started to click we started to win games and he put in an off-season program and we had a real committed group of guys. And at the time we had grade 13, right? So in Ontario, so we're all uh, like 18, 19 years old and doing very well and, and winning. And, and after I graduated, uh, we lost our championship game when I was in thir grade 13. And uh, I just remember sitting in a locker room after devastated, but thinking about how much this had meant to me, right? To have gone through this journey. And I didn't want it to end. And, uh, you know, got invited to a high school all-star camp in uh, Winnipeg that was put on by the Blue Bombers. And I went to that in April and I got recruited by a number of schools to play and I ended up choosing the University of Manitoba. And a couple of my friends went there too. It turns out my, my girlfriend at the time, who I ended up marrying, uh, went to Manitoba as well. And part of the reason I went into faculty of education is because I wanted to be a coach. Uh, I, I always saw it's funny how many teaching. people who are teachers now say exactly what you just said. I wanted to be a teacher so that I could coach, even though we have less coaching going on with teachers. Now, the amount of people who actually say those specific words, 
is like so, a lot of the best coaches we've ever had have said, yeah, I just wanted to coach, but so I, so I became a teacher. Well, I, I just, I thought it, it's the same thing. Teaching is coaching and coaching right. is teaching. And I think the difference when you're, when you're a coach is just the level that you get to know the kids. And the more you know about them, the better job you can do with them, helping them get to where they want to be, right? And, and in a perfect world, you get that reciprocal relationship where it's almost like a synergy where you're working hard, they're working hard, so you want to work harder for them and they want to work harder for you. And, and that's what I had in high school. And that's what I was hoping for uh, in my teaching career. And so I played a couple of years at the University of Manitoba. Um, wasn't, wasn't by any means a, a great player, but I was on the team for a couple of years. And then uh, I was also a forest firefighter and we just had a bad season one year. There's a lot of fires and, and I chose to uh, leave the team and continue to do that. I kind of needed the money and, and it just, I felt like it was a decision that, that I needed to make at the time. And uh, I regretted that. I should have kept playing because, you know, your, your, your window to play is so small. And even though I had the five years of high school and, and two years of university, that, that was a decision that I regretted. Because I think, you know, you know, you know what, I, I think that's a huge point for people because I think a lot of athletes, while they're doing it, they realize this is really hard. I don't need to do this. And a lot of kids quit. And and looking back at it, I think most of the people who end up quitting say, what the hell was I doing? I, I, I should have kept playing. You know, life is, is short. You know, you don't get to play. It's not like, it's not like you can go back and play when you're 50, right? Like, so you, you got to maximize those opportunities when you get them and, and use them as opportunities for growth. hundred percent. And, uh, you know, the, the whole time I was playing, I knew I was never going to be a professional player or anything like that, but I was playing because I love the game and uh, I wanted to learn as much as I could to be the best coach I could be. And, um, you know, I, I was maybe 20 when I stepped away from the game. And again, I, I shouldn't have done that. It, it, it is something that, that I regretted because I actually think that probably had I stuck out another two years, I, I would have been a bit more of a, an impact player. And, but when you're young, you know, you've got an ego and you're not playing very much and, and you think maybe you should be, but, in hindsight, you're like, no, the coach has had it right. You know, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And uh, I think a lot of kids go through that now at a much younger age, right? And and that's a challenge that we have, right, is trying to keep kids connected to sport, like absolutely. I said. Absolutely. So you, what did you graduate uh, university with? I graduated with uh, a Bachelor of Education degree. Manitoba had a program at the time where you could go into the faculty of education right out of high school. It was a four-year program, and you're student teaching right out of the gate. So in your first year, you're doing teaching practicums. So you really knew if you wanted to do it or not. And uh, so even though it's a four-year program, there was a lot of uh, time spent in the school. And uh, I had also played basketball throughout high school. I loved basketball. Uh, I might have been a better basketball player than, than I was football player, but by no means university talent for, for basketball. Um, but, you know, in, in university, I played intramural basketball and just kept, kept up with the sport. And uh, in my last year of, of the faculty of education, I, I had a practicum that was uh, real close to my house. Uh, I think it was Fort Gary Middle School. And uh, well, it was like a junior high school. So it was, it, kids were grade eight and nine. And uh, they didn't have a basketball coach. And um, I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll give it a, a go. And so as a practicum teacher, I took this team on, even though the practicum was only five weeks, the commitment to coach that team was much longer, right? Because uh, I think it was uh, November and the season went till March. So I took that team on and we ended up winning the city championship. And it was just a great experience for me. And it, it affirmed that I, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach and I wanted to coach. And the time that I was in the school teaching, you know, I'd have a couple of those kids in each of my classes and it just made things better, right? The kids knew me and they kind of would vouch for me. And, and, you know, if kids started to, you know, goof around or whatever, they'd be like, Hey, cut it out. You know, it's coach, you got to listen to the coach. And, and that respect and that relationship is something that I, I always wanted. And, and I, I had it 
at a young age. So you know, it's funny. I was talking to Rich Chambers, and he he, he said the exact same thing. He said he actually feels sorry for the teachers that don't coach. <laughs> he, he's a little more vocal with his criticism, but he says I feel sorry for the people that don't coach because they don't understand what they're missing out on. You know, what, whatever it is, it doesn't matter if it's basketball or football or whatever. Any you can coach anything, and and you get to have a better connection with the students, and you get to have a and they have a better connection with you, and so you know. I can't imagine too many, you know, head football coaches are walking into a classroom and the kids aren't listening too, too well right off the top. Neither can I. I. I totally agree with you. But I would even take it one step further. Like, I'm a huge public school guy, right? Like, I, I think that uh, public schools are supposed to be this equalizer for kids, right? Any kid should be able to come in and, ha and get to where they want to be if they're willing to put the work in. And it's our job to help them get there. And where I think sports comes into play is, uh, like, for me anyway, and I've seen it with just dozens and dozens of kids, often it's the first time they've ever really tried their best at anything, like really given it. And uh, I think it's because of the accountability that sports creates. Uh, they're accountable suddenly to their coach, their, their teammates. It's the visible nature of it, too, in the school. And it just can in in a perfect in the right situation make them realize their potential in a way that maybe they don't uh just in the classroom but i've also seen it in more than sports like i've seen it in dr good drama programs band programs like the fine arts you, we have to provide ways for kids to connect outside of the na normal curriculum for kids in school and the more they connect the better their school experience is Totally. And it's funny, I was listening to an interview with the, the founder of Lululemon yesterday, and he was talking about how they were like, you're notorious, uh, uh, an early person to meetings, you show up early to everything. And you're like, one of those five minutes early is, is late type people. What, what created that? And he goes, I was a competitive swimmer, six days a week, we were in the pool, late's not really an option. And so he's like, it translated to the rest of my life. And I think I think uh, I think it really makes a huge difference. So you start you start coaching. Your first coaching gig is, is basketball. Uh, tell us a little bit about basketball. How long did you coach basketball for, and what was that like? Sure. So I did that first season while I was still in university, and then uh, when we graduated at the time, it's 1993. Um, there, Manitoba just made a bunch of cuts to their education system. There was no jobs in Ontario uh, for teachers. Uh, I was recently married and uh, so we were both looking for a teaching opportunity and the one that presented itself is uh, was for the Prince Rupert School District and uh, but it was in an indigenous community off the coast so it was a fly-in only community 400 people there was about 90 kids in the school grades kindergarten to 10 and uh, that's where we went we spent two years there and basketball is king up there uh, it, it blew me away, the level of um, interest in basketball in those communities. Uh, the community we were in was Kitkatla. And, uh, and th this, is, this is no word of a lie. There was kids named Michael Jordan. Like they, the kids were born and there's Michael Jordan Bolton, Michael Jordan Innes, Michael, like that, that was their names. And I, I, that's how much they love basketball and Bulls jerseys everywhere. And, and so it was a big deal. And, I, and so I coached up there uh, and taught PE, shop, science, math, just about everything. And school only went to grade 10 and we had to travel a lot. And it, it was a tough, tough go. And we did our two years. And then I had some friends that had come to Surrey uh, from my high school football program. Uh, guys are, I'm still really tight with. And uh Jordy Cameron, he he's been, he was he was our offensive coordinator for for Lord Tweedsmer up until just a few years ago, and uh, he was teaching here in Surrey, and he convinced us to come down and give it a try. And both my wife and I got hired right away. I got hired at Lord Tweedsmer um, in 1995, and they needed a Grade Eight basketball coach, so I stepped up and coached Grade Eight basketball there, and then uh, I moved into junior boys basketball and. I did that until uh, I started my master's degree in, in 2000 and uh, took a hiatus from coaching uh, to complete the master's degree. And uh, after that, um, well, 
feel like I'm getting long winded here. I don't know if I'm boring you or not, but uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot at Tweeds around at the time. Well, I shouldn't say that we were running all the sports. Like we have basketball, volleyball, more known for rugby at the time, but there wasn't really a program feel for any of them. I would say they were a collection of teams, right? So well, I'll be honest with you. I, when I was growing up, I was just a 2003 grad. We didn't even know what Lord Tweetsner was. Like it wasn't a thing. And now Lord Tweetsner is one of the dominant sports programs in the entire province. So I don't think you're off to a, off course there. Like I never even heard of Lord Tweetsner in high school, let alone, you know, uh, what it is today which is one of the more recognizable brands in the entire province yeah and and you're right and i was going to say when I, in my second year coaching we came second in a tournament and it was one of the only to- trophies in the in the trophy case right it was this huge deal to to come second in a in a junior boys basketball tournament but uh anyway uh so i took some time off of coaching i, I was continuing my education i wanted to become a counselor uh, because I just felt that I needed to learn more about how to help kids. The problems that I was having in the classroom or seeing kids go through, um, I felt that at least learning about counseling was going to make me a better teacher. At the time, I wasn't really sure I would move into a counseling position, but I wanted to, well, be a better coach, better teacher, all those things. And I thought that was, that was probably the best degree for me to get. So I took some time off to do that. And then uh, shortly after, I actually had a, a, a pretty serious medical uh, condition. I, I, uh, it was Halloween night. I had three little kids. And uh, my oldest was seven, and my youngest was 18 months old. And I had um, chest pain. I was 33 years old. And I was like, this, this can't be a heart attack. Like, what, what is going on here, right? And my wife took me to the hospital, and it turns out they discovered I had a an old blockage in my heart uh, from something called Kawasaki disease. So when I was a child, like seven, eight years old, I actually had an aneurysm in my heart and lived and probably shouldn't have. And it became calcified and I was having a series of heart attacks because the blockage was breaking apart. And uh, so I spent a lot of time in the hospital. It was end of October and um, Anyway, while I'm in the hospital, Brian Gemmel, one of the athletic directors at Lord Tweedsmer, uh, calls and says, uh, hey, we're starting a football program at Tweedsmer. You, you want to be a part of it. I know you played in college and you coached in the community a bit. Uh, any interest? I was like, Brian, I, I don't even know if I'm going to be back at work. Like, you know, I'm, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. And, and part of me didn't believe it either because I was – thinking, I know how hard it is to run a football program. It it's, takes an immense amount of work. And I kind of thought, you know, you guys are probably biting off more than you can chew here. This is Lord Tweedsmer. We've got pretty good girls basketball program, but to actually put a football program in is going to be a monumental task. And so I didn't think much of it and had the surgery and was recovering and uh, went into the school. And he's like, oh, come, come see. We got all the equipment down here. We've got a bunch of kids signed up. So I went down into one of the storage rooms and sure enough, there's a set of uniforms there. He's got the equipment. He had a very motivated parent group driving uh, the school to put this program in. So I agreed to help. And uh, but I didn't know how much I could do yet because, I, like I said, I was just coming back to work and, and uh, recovering from this condition. And the head coach at the time was already named. It was Matt Phillips. I don't know if you know anything about Matt, but he... Uh, he was a retired teacher. He had started seven programs throughout uh, the province, uh, mainly in Richmond, but he had spent some time at Frank Hurt. And, um, you know, he, he was the head coach. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. The first time I met him, I'm walking into the school because I was still on leave. He's walking out. He says, you, you Thornton? Yeah. He says, so uh, you're going to coach with me, right? Apparently. And he said, well, what are you going to coach? So what do you need me to coach? I said, and I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to work with the linemen. I, I was a defensive lineman primarily in, in university, but I played O-line as well. And he says, all right, so you're coaching the D-line. You got a defensive end. We're losing contain continually. Uh, uh, teams just keeps running toss and option. Toss. What are you going to do? How are you, you going to stop that? <laughs> it's like, okay, so I'm the teacher at the school. You guys are asking me to help. 
And now I'm getting an interview in the parking lot about, you know, how, how am I going to stop the toss on this imaginary team with this imaginary defensive end? So, but I guess he liked my answer and, uh, you know, it, it went from there. So uh, the first year I coached the line and, uh, oh, I should tell you too, the next time I met with him, we assembled his staff and uh, uh, we're talking about roles and I'm like, okay, so who's going to be the offensive coordinator? He says, I am. Who's going to be the defensive coordinator? I am. Who's going to coach special teams? I am. It's like, well, there's five of us sitting here. Like, you know, we've all played college football and you put this staff together and it was just how he was, but it was awesome. And I learned a lot from him. And at the end of that year, he said, you know what, Kurt, you should be the head coach. So even though it only been one year, he said, you know, it's, it would be better if, uh, because you're a teacher in the school, you should be the senior varsity head coach. And I'd like to start a junior varsity team. So we put the junior varsity team in and uh, uh, he coached that and they actually won the provincial championship in his first year uh, no there. And we went to the provincial championship as a senior team in my very first year as a coach, we were 10 and 0, but we lost to Windsor in the finals. And, you know, I talking to my dad before in the week leading up, I'm like, dad, you know, it's my first year as a head coach. We're in the senior varsity finals and, you know, any chance you and mom would come out and watch this game, you could, you know, maybe stay through till Christmas. And he's like, it's your first year, you're going to be back there. You know, like, uh, we'll come next time. Well, next time didn't happen until last year, right? So 16 years, <laughs> took 16 years to get back. But uh, yeah, it was just just the mindset. So, uh, but all throughout that I had like early on, we had this really awesome group of parents who was continually fundraising, uh, understood the, the importance of trying to get three levels of football into the school. And really, it was about program building, right? So and I think that's a big thing. So, sorry, sorry to catch up. I, I want to talk about building it. So when, when you took over, they have been there for a year. So obviously, a little bit of infrastructure was set up. But football is not like a one-person operation. It's a, it's a whole community because you need to fundraise to make – the, to pay for the bills you gotta you gotta get the jerseys you gotta do all the team building stuff there's so many people you gotta build a coaching staff so what was your first um when you're building your coaching staff what were your, some of your first priorities who are the people that kind of brought you in there with where did you who did you bring in with you well so um right out of the gate so i, I had mentioned a guy jordy cameron he he's a friend of mine I, he was actually one of my roommates in university we played high school football together and we uh we uh, played university football together. He was a receiver for the Bisons. We were roommates, and uh, he's the one who convinced me to come here. He was teaching at a school close to Lord Tweedsmore. He was at, at Clayton Heights, and he was actually uh, coaching at Tweedsmore while he was teaching at Clayton because he loved football so much. And that year, we were able to, uh, our principal was able to get him into Tweedsmore. So there was a job for him. He posted in, and uh, that made a huge difference because now, I had two teacher coaches coaching on a senior varsity team. He was the offensive coordinator. I was the head coach. And then Matt Phillips' son ran the defense. So he was already committed to be a coach. So we had a, a core group. And uh, then we had another guy, a local guy, Rob Parkman, uh, coached DBs and, and helped where he could. There, and uh, our band teacher, actually, his kid was on the team. He coached kicking. So uh, he was a soccer guy and he coached our kicker. So we actually had three teachers uh, right out of the gate with some commitment to the football program, which was awesome. And I had this really committed group of parents fundraising. And, and, and early on, it was a dream coaching job because they didn't have to worry about anything but coaching. Like we would go on the road, we'd go to the island, and the parents would have the meals all reserved for us, all set up. And I was like, this is, this is awesome. But that didn't continue, right? Uh, those parents, once, you know, after a period of time, they, they're gone and that's where things get hard right is you have to get a continued effort from a group of parents to make sure that the funds are there if as a coach when you're building a program you're trying to do all of that well you're not going to last very long right you you have to learn how to delegate and you have to learn how to get people to buy in you're not just selling football to kids you're selling football to a community and to a parents and, and to administrators because, uh, you know, when you've got uh, all the stakeholders pulling in the same direction, that's when, that's when it, it's a treat, right, to be a head coach. When one of those stakeholders isn't fully in, 
you feel it right away. And, How many uh, and you, that since you started teaching? Since I started teaching. At, at Tweedsmer. At Tweedsmer. Um, let me quickly count. Seven. Seven. In 16 years, is that what you said? Uh, no, I've been at Tweedsmer since for 25 years. 25 years. So I would imagine some principals have been extraordinarily supportive and some have not been quite as supportive. What's it like having to deal with the difference in opportunity that you maybe didn't, maybe some people just said, hey, we love what you're doing, keep doing it. And some maybe said, well, you know, we're not really sure if this is totally something we need to be doing. And we've all heard the stories. What, what, what are some of those things? Give me some of the comparables. Well, so early on, uh, actually, the, the first, while we had football, uh, the first two principles that I dealt with uh, were extremely supportive, right? Uh, worked really hard to try to get teacher coaches in to the school. And um, uh, we've never been a drain financially, though. Like, this is, uh, this is one of the things that uh, we made a commitment to early, was that we weren't going to be coming asking for money repeatedly. Uh, we were going to do our best to be self-sustainable financially, but we would like support where you can give us support, right? And so uh, that, that seemed to go a long way, I think, with those principles. And uh, as a result, they also saw the, the number of kids that were playing. So at our peak, we had a number of years there where we had 120 kids in the program between grade eight, JV, and, and senior. Most of the rosters were functioning between 35 and 50 kids. And so it was pretty impressive when you walk out to the field and you see 120 kids in football equipment all busy, all after school. And like my vision for the program was to be not just elite, but inclusive. And that's one of the beautiful things about the sport is any kid can do it as long as they're willing to commit to it, right? You can carry 40 kids. When you coach basketball, I coach grade eight basketball, you get 50 kids try out. You're there by yourself as the coach and you're trying to get down to a team that you know you can work with. But at the end of the day, you're sending 35 kids away. And that's a hard thing to do. And, and you don't have to do that with football. And I think that uh, uh, early on, at least, our admin teams really saw that and, and understood that this was something that a lot of kids could be a part of. And, and it, it, it paid dividends. Um, I wouldn't say we haven't had supportive administrators. I think they've all been supportive how they could be. But sometimes, you know, you have situations uh, in large public schools that are kind of beyond anybody's control. Like when we have overcrowding in our school, which we, we had for a long time, like we, we've been up to almost 30 portables and, and so on. And you've got a kid who wants to come and play football because his school doesn't have it. Well, sometimes the answer is just no, because we don't have space, right? And you can interpret that as being unsupportive as an administrator but really they're just doing their job. And, and it can be a tough pill to swallow as a coach because you might need kids and you want all these kids to play, you want to play, but sometimes there's just nothing the administration can do. When they can help, the expectation is they help. And uh, when you're in that, that situation where everything's working, it, it's pretty gratifying. Absolutely, so when, when you're building a program, you guys have obviously been a pretty good team for quite a while. Um, what were some of the core principles you thought were important while building it together? So first thing was we wanted to get to three levels of football, right? So the idea is if you have a significant base at grade eight, you go into grade eight football knowing that not every kid is going to continue after grade eight. But if you can get 20 kids to keep playing football, then you're going to have good numbers throughout every year of football after that, right? And if we can develop kids for five years, well, now you're going to have a competitive situation, right? Uh, the other one is off-season training. It's for football, it's a must. And, and football is a little different because your off-season training primarily is physical training. It's weightlifting, strength training, speed training. Uh, it doesn't necessarily involve a ton of skill development. There's some, like, you know, we do seven on seven in the spring and so on, but the bulk of it is getting your body ready and as strong and as fast as you can. 
And that's something that early on uh, I would have changed. So we ha had off-season training, but I was running it at night. I was in the school, you know, three nights a week. And, and we had a couple of awesome community members that were running our off-season training, uh, including like Baron Miles did it for a couple of years with his wife, Jennifer. Uh, Raleigh Lambala did it for a while with us and, and they were terrific. But it, it just never felt like enough for me. And couldn't get full buy-in from the kids. And then another problem that evolved for us was we started to get kids that were choosing to train instead of play other sports at the school. And that didn't sit right with me, right? So say I got a kid who in grade eight is playing basketball and football, and uh, now we're saying to him, you know, you want to keep playing football, you, you've got to train. It's part of the deal. And so they started, we had some kids who were choosing to train or focus on football instead of continue to play other sports, mainly basketball and rugby. And I, I, I just being a multi-sport guy myself, I didn't like that. And so we started to make a push towards a more uh, U.S. model where uh, our training became curricular. And we, we were able to convince uh, our principal at the time to have one block for the next year's uh, um, senior varsity team uh, of we call it bigger faster stronger we modeled it after Terry Fox they had a similar uh, program in place and it's five days of strength and speed training a, a week and for your 75 minute block and it went really well and then we opened that course up to the school and we went from one block to three blocks to five blocks to seven blocks to every block in the day now as a full, bigger, faster, stronger uh, class. It's become the most popular elective at Lord Tweedsmer. And athletes from all sports participate, including girls' sports. And I think that it, it's a real cornerstone of the athletic department. Um, and what it does is it frees the kids up then to, to do what they want after school. If it's play another sport or some of them have to work in the off season, all those different things, it's taken care of during the day and they're ready to go come spring camp and fall. Well, and you know what it is? It, it replaces, uh, you know, maybe a class that they might have taken that was they didn't really like or didn't really take too seriously or, you know, it wasn't quite for them. They are just kind of killing time. So, I mean, they took a killing time class and they turned it into a, a high-level performance class. That's that's exactly what you want to do in, in a school. So now you, you've created you've created this thing. Your first team you, you do is, you know, you go all the way to the final. Kind of like Marty Jona, his career went the same way. He went to the Stanley Cup final uh, with the Oilers in his first year, and he didn't make it back till one of his last years with the Calgary Flames. So, talk about the journey between your first year. You know, I, I have had similar experience where my teams were very good when I first started, and it's been tough to get back to where you were. And and so that you know you're building so many different things, and you see the progression, and you know you're doing a much better job than you were when you started but the results aren't kind of coming in the way that they did, you know, kind of at that beginning. So talk about continually building and getting the program better, but not getting the, the, the final result you wanted and then finally getting it when, when it came. Well, one of the things that happened to us, um, like when we came in, we were quite a bit smaller of a school. We were a legitimate double A size school. So we were playing double A football and uh, we played double A football for our first five years. And, Every one of those years, we were highly competitive and uh, I, we lost in the semifinals a bunch of times to the team that eventually won. And uh, in particular, one of those years, we probably should have been uh, uh, the provincial championship, but uh, it just didn't happen. And uh, so I, I always had, throughout those years, I had some terrific football players. And even though we were a double A team, we were putting kids into college and university and they were, they were doing well. Like they were starting early in university. Some of them were all stars. We had three kids from those early teams make the CFL. And so I knew that we were doing something right. When we moved to uh, AAA, that's when, uh, well, it was, a, it was a smack in the face. Like it was a big, big jump for us. Uh, and, uh, uh, like that's, it wasn't so much the, the scheme that we were running. Uh, we knew that we were pretty solid with a lot of that stuff. 
it was the the physical matchups that we were losing across the board and and you know i'm sure probably similar for you in basketball right you you get justified in what you're doing because you've had success doing it but sometimes you know sometimes you just don't have the level of talent that the other team does and and in football it gets really magnified when you can't compete physically and that's that's that was the impetus for putting in the bigger faster stronger courses we knew we had to get on mass our football players physically ready for what they were going to face in the fall when you're playing double a football you're playing a matchup game right so if i've got three three really good football players I could probably match them up against your best players. We can take, we can make you play left-handed, right? We can take away what you do well, probably make some enough plays over the course of the game to win the game, or at least be competitive. In triple A football, most, the better teams anyway, are solid across the board. And it's not as much about a matchup game as it is about uh, having really good systems and having the athletes to match up in every level right and so uh every position group and that's what we had to get to so uh it was a challenge and we went through uh two really hard years in uh in triple a and then we started to win and uh the the benefits of the uh uh off-season training uh we also were fortunate uh we, we hired lou delorier our principal was able to get him in he had been head coach i don't know if you know lou but he'd be a good interview for you too uh you know, one of the best players in the CFL when he played and, and uh, head coach at UBC, defensive coordinator at SFU. And, and uh, he made a big difference too when we, we moved to, to AAA. And he, he taught a lot of our bigger, faster, stronger program as well, along with another coach that we had, Gord Massey. So at our peak there, we had seven teacher coaches. Wow. And, uh, but over time, we've lost pretty much all of them uh just you know guys can only do it for so long or they move on they transfer schools that sort of thing and um but yeah that that was those are the things that made the difference so i would say you know the the off-season training the three levels of football supportive admin supportive athletic director uh numerous teachers on staff and uh yeah talented kids when you have that you're going to win games Absolutely. So now let's talk about, let's take the benefits of football and, and how you think it's translated to the rest of your life and made you better in the rest of your life. Well, that's, I would say that, um, you know, anybody who knows me, uh, when I get, um, when I get uh, interested in an issue, I'm like a dog on a bone. Or if I feel like something's important, I can be pretty relentless towards getting what I want. And I think that's the competitive side in me, right? And, and when I first started playing sports, I would say I was competitive, but I was more, I liked just being on the team and trying hard for my buddies and, and all that stuff. But over time, you, you really learn that all those cliches that you hear about hard work and success and you know everybody pulling in one, they're all true right? Like they, they're cliches because they're true. And, and uh, so I think that what I've learned is that, yeah, when you work hard and, and you have a vision and a goal, it doesn't matter if it's football, you could translate that into other things in your life. And that's what I want for the kids too, right? I want them over the five years that they spent in the program to gain confidence, right? We want to put them in situations that are hard. We want, we want to make them work hard. We want to make them play for each other and, and for their school. And when they have that success and they've done everything right, then I want them to take that into their personal life and, and, and do what they want to do and reach their potential. And that's when it's beautiful, right? When you see that kid, he may not be the best player, but you know what? He's, he's gone and he's become a lawyer or he's the, he's the best carpenter in Surrey or, or whatever it is. They, you see that they've taken what they've learned and made themselves the best that they can be. Absolutely. And I think it translates. And I think uh, especially football, work ethic, communication, uh, nonstop compete, all that stuff translates to the rest of their life and it, it ends up leading them to more success. Well, listen, uh, 
last question for you. If you could go back in time and give a younger version of yourself a little bit of advice, what, what would be the one, two things you would tell them to kind of, you know, listen, take a look at this. This is probably something you need to try a little differently. Uh, I think, I think it would be to delegate better. Uh, you know, early on, I, like I said, I didn't have to, uh, I, I had all, I had quite a support system around me that was allowing me to just coach. Right. But over time I took more and more on and, uh, uh, you know, right down to all the equipment and just, just almost everything in the program, you have help there, but you have to ask for it sometimes. And early on I didn't, and I wish that I was better at asking for help. Because, um, yeah, it just probably would have, would have helped a lot of things, right? Well, I, you know what, I think I think one of the things that happens, um, you know, obviously, your, your business, so I'm, I'm in business uh, as, a, as a company, your business is education. And in your business, the, the values you learn in football translate to the educational system, and it makes for better educational learning opportunities, and it makes for better uh, experiences for the kids and better opportunity for them in the future. And so I think it's really cool what you've done. I'm, I'm very happy to have had you on the program and I really appreciate you coming out and, and hopefully enjoy some downtime this year. Hopefully, you know, no football to watch on TV. Hopefully we get some football on TV soon and, and you'll have something to do. Yeah, I hope so. Well, I'm still working on the board. I'm on the BC high school football board and we're right on the, head of safety of all things. So we're pretty wrapped up in this pandemic right now. And uh, yeah, I, it, it's, uh, we, we remain hopeful, you know, but, uh, but the reality is, it's a pandemic, right? So yeah, um, we got to keep these kids safe. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, sir.